but the privations, or rather the hardships of Lowood lessened, which means things are getting easier. Spring drew on, indeed, or she was indeed already come. The frosts of winter had ceased, its snows were melted, its cutting winds ameliorated, which means made better. That's what ameliorate means. My wretched feet, flayed and swollen to the lameness by the sharp air of January, began to heal and subside under the gentle, gentler breathings of April. You know how it gets really dry in the winter and your like feet crack? Maybe not because y'all are teenagers, but it can happen. <laughs> the nights and mornings, no longer by their Canadian temperature, froze the very blood in our veins. We could now endure the play hour past in the garden. Sometimes on a sunny day it began even to be pleasant and genial, and a greenness grew over those brown beds which, freshening daily, suggested the thought that hope traversed them at night and left each morning brighter traces of her steps. Notice that, um, that Charlotte Bronte and the narrator Jane capitalizes hope, which is not super common in this time period, um, but perhaps the capitalization, which is incorrect, um, is purposeful to denote that hope is really important and needed. Flowers peeped out amongst the leaves, snowdrops, uh, crocuses, purple, auriculas, and golden-eyed pansies. On Thursday afternoons, half holidays, we now took walks and found still sweeter flowers opening by the wayside under the hedges. I discovered too that a great pleasure, an enjoyment which the horizon only bounded, lay all outside the high and spike-guarded walls of our garden. This pleasure consisted in prospect of noble summits girdling a great hill hollow, rich in verdure and shadow, and a bright back full of dark stones and sparkling eddies. How different had this scene looked when I viewed it laid out beneath that iron sky of winter, stiffened in frost, shrouded with snow, when mists as chill as death wandered to the impulse of east winds along those purple peaks and rolled down the ing and the holm till they blended with the frozen fog of the beck. So what I love about this book is the poetry in the prose because she's basically saying like winter, this landscape was harsh and ugly and it reminded her of death and she uses the word shrouded, even death, um, frozen, fog, all kind of like this gothic death-like imagery. And so the way she describes the scene is so poetic and that's one of the reasons why I really love Charlotte Bronte. Anyhow, I just wanted to point that out. That beck itself was then a torrent, turbid and curbless. It tore us under the wood and sent a raving sound through the air, often thickened with wild rain or whirling sleet. And for the forest on its banks, that showed only ranks of skeletons. April advanced to May. A bright, serene May it was. Days of blue sky, placid sunshine, and soft western or southern gales filled up its duration. And now vegetation matured with vigor. Lowood shook loose its tresses. It became all green, all flowery. Its great elm, ash, and oak skeletons were restored to majestic life. Woodland plants sprang up profusely in its recesses. Unnumbered varieties of moss filled its hollows, and it made a strange ground sunshine out of the wealth of its wild primrose plants. I have seen their pale gold gleam in overshadowed spots like scatterings of the sweetest luster. All this I enjoyed often and fully, free, unwatched, and almost alone. For this unwanted liberty and pleasure there was a cause, to which it now becomes my task to advert, like to advertise. Had I not described a pleasant site for a dwelling, when I speak of it as blossomed in hill and wood and rising from the verge of a stream, assuredly pleasant enough, but whether healthy or not is another question. That forest dell where Lowood lay was the cradle of fog and fog-bred pestilence, which, quickening with the quickening spring, crept into the orphan asylum, breathed typhus through its crowded schoolroom and dormitory, and ere May arrived, transformed the seminary into a hospital. So she's saying even though she can see all of this beautiful nature growing and springing to life, just how with all the seasons, like plants, you know, lose their leaves and come back, Unfortunately, where Lowood is situated, um, it brought typhus in, which is a very deadly, bad disease, and it turns this orphan asylum, which instead of calling it a school or a boarding school, an asylum is more of like a prison-like term, and it's turning it into a hospital, meaning everyone is getting sick. Semi-starvation, because we know they're not being fed well, and neglected colds had predisposed most of the pupils to receive infection. 45 out of the 80 girls lay ill at one time. That's over half. Classes were broken up, rules relaxed. 
the few who continued well were allowed almost unlimited license because the medical attendant insisted on the necessity of frequent exercise to keep them in health, and had it been otherwise, no one had leisure to watch or restrain them. Ms. Temple's whole attention was absorbed by the patients. She lived in the sick room, never quitting it except to snatch a few hours rest at night. The teachers were fully occupied with packing up and making other necessary preparations for the departure of those girls who were fortunate enough to have friends and relations able and willing to remove them from the seat of um, contagion, which means some girls were able to go live with family to avoid getting sick. Many, already smitten, went home only to die. Some died at the school and were buried quietly and quickly, the nature of the malady forbidding delay. So this is also from Charlotte Bronte's life. She went to a boarding school where two of her sisters died. One did get home, but also died shortly thereafter. So this is somewhat semi-autobiographical. -autobiogra um, and because so many were sick, not like no one attended the funerals and yeah. While disease had thus become an inhabitant of Lowood and death its frequent visitor, while there was gloom and fear within its walls, while its rooms and passages steamed with hospital smells, the drug and the pastille striving vainly to overcome the effluvia of mortality, that bright May shone unclouded over the bold hills and beautiful woodland out of doors. Its garden, too, glowed with flowers. Hollyhocks had sprung up as tall as trees, lilies had opened, tulips and roses were in bloom, the borders of the little beds were gay with pink thrift and crimson double daisies, the sweet briars gave out, morning and evening, their scent of spice and apples, and these fragrant treasures were all useless for most of the inmates of Lowood, except to furnish now and then a handful of herbs and blossoms to put in a coffin. Again, so there's this juxtaposition of illness and death inside Lowood, even though it's spring and flowers and beauty, even beautiful scents outside. But I and the rest who continued well enjoyed fully the beauties of the scene and season. They let us ramble in the wood like gypsies from morning till night. And gypsy, of course, now is not politically correct. This book, of course, is almost 200 years old. Um, so just so you guys know, from morning till night, we did what we liked, went where we liked. We lived better too. Mr. Brocklehurst and his family never came near Lowood now. Household matters were not scrutinized into. The cross housekeeper was gone, driven away by the fear of infection. Her successor, who had been matron at, at the Lowood dispensary, unused to the ways of her new abode, provided with comparative liberality. Besides, there were fewer to feed. The sick could eat little. Our breakfast basins were better filled. When there was no time to prepare a regular dinner, which often happened, she would give us a large piece of cold pie or a thick slice of bread and cheese, and this we carried away with us to the wood, where we each chose the spot we liked best and dined sumptuously. So they're eating more food because Mr. Brocklehurst isn't coming around to check um, to see that they're not eating well, and um, they can eat more because there are fewer mouths to feed. My favorite seat was a smooth and broad stone, rising white and dry from the very middle of the back and only to be got at by wading through the water, a feat I accomplished barefoot. The stone was just broad enough to accommodate comfortably another girl and me, at that time my chosen comrade, one Marianne Wilson, a shrewd and observant personage whose society I took pleasure in, partly because she was witty and original and partly because she had a manner which set me at my ease. Some years older than I, she knew more of the world and could tell me many things I liked to hear. <coughs> With her, my curiosity found gratification. To my fault, she also gave ample indulgence, never imposing curb or rein on anything I said. She had a turn for narrative, I for analysis. She liked to inform, I to question. So we got along on swimmingly together, deriving much entertainment, if not much improvement, from our mutual intercourse. And where, meantime, was Helen Burns? Why did I not spend these sweet days of liberty with her? Had I forgotten her? Or was I so worthless as to have grown tired of her pure society? Surely the Marianne Wil Wilson I have mentioned was inferior to my first acquaintance. She could only tell me amusing stories and reciprocate any racy and pungent gossip I chose to indulge in. While, if I have spoken truth of Helen, she was qualified to give those who enjoy the privilege of her converse a taste of far higher things. True reader, and I knew and felt this, 
and though I'm a defective being with many faults and few redeeming points, yet I never tired of Helen Burns, nor ever ceased to cherish for her a sentiment of attachment as strong, tender, and respectful as any that ever animated my heart. So she's now speaking directly to us and telling us, like, she's really average, like Jane considers herself average with few good things, which I think she's being a little harsh on herself, which is in the tradition of apologia or apologizing for perhaps falsely not being better. Um, let's see. Uh, now I have to find where I left off. How could it be otherwise when Helen at all times and under all circumstances evinced for me a quiet and faithful friendship, which ill humor never soured nor irritation never troubled? But Helen was ill at present. For some weeks she had been removed from my sight to I knew not what room upstairs. She was not, I was told, in the hospital portion of the house with the fever patients, for her complaint was consumption, not typhus. And by consumption, I, in my ignorance, understood something mild, which time and care would be sure to alleviate or make better. I was confirmed in this idea by the fact of her once or twice coming downstairs on very warm sunny afternoons and being taken by Miss Temple into the garden, but on these occasions I was not allowed to go and speak to her. I only saw her from the schoolroom window, and then not distinctly, for we, she was much wrapped up and sat at a distance under the veranda. One evening in the beginning of June I had stayed out very late with Marianne in the wood. We had, as usual, separated ourselves from the others, and had wandered far, so far that we lost our way and had to ask it at a lonely cottage where a man and woman lived, who looked after a herd of half-wild swine that fed on the mast in the wood. When we got back, it was after moonrise. A pony, which we knew to be the surgeon's, was standing at the garden door. Marianne remarked that she supposed someone must be very ill, as Mr. Bates had been sent for at that time of evening. She went into the house. I stayed behind a few minutes to plant in my garden a handful of roots I had dug up in the forest, and which I feared would wither if I left them till the morning. This done, I lingered yet a little longer. The flowers smelt so sweet as the dew fell. It was such a pleasant evening, so serene, so warm. The still glowing west promised so fairly another fine day on the morrow. The moon rose with such majesty in the grave east. I was noticing these things and enjoying them as a child might, when it entered my mind as it had never done before. How sad to be lying now on a sick bed and to be in danger of dying. This world is pleasant. How would it be dreary to how would be dreary to be called from it and to have to go to who knows where? And then my mind made its first earnest effort to comprehend what had been infused into it concerning heaven and hell, and for this first time it recoiled, baffled, and for the first time glancing behind on each side and before it. It saw all around an unfathomed gulf. It felt the one point where it stood, the present. All the rest was formless cloud and vacant depth, and while it shuddered at the thought of tottering and plunging amid the chaos. While pondering this new idea, I heard the front door open. Mr. Bates came out, and with him was a nurse. After she had seen him mount his horse and depart, she was about to close the door, but I ran up to her. How was Helen Burns? Very poorly was the answer. Is it her Mr. Bates has been to see? Yes. And what does he say about her? He says she'll not be here long. And so Jane's just beginning to understand the concept of death and like what most of the girls are experiencing here. This phrase uttered in my hearing yesterday would have only conveyed the notion that she was about to be removed to Northumberland, to her own home. I should not have suspected that it meant she was dying, but I knew instantly now it opened clear on my comprehension that Helen Burns was numbering her last days in this world and that she was going to be taken to the region of spirits, if such a region there were. So this is kind of an agnostic feeling, right? Jane has been raised as a Christian, um, but to not know what happens in the afterlife, that's more of an agnostic uh, belief system that she's expressing. I experienced a shock of horror, and then a shrill thrill, then a strong thrill of grief, and then a desire, a necessity to see her, and I asked in what room she lay. She is in Miss Temple's room, said the nurse. May I go up and speak to her? Oh no, child, it is not likely, and now it is time for you to come in. You'll catch the fever if you stop out when the dew is falling. The nurse closed the front door. I went in by the side entrance which led to the schoolroom. I was just in time. It was nine o'clock and Miss Miller was calling the pupils to go to bed. It might, have been, 
It might be two hours later, probably near 11, when I, not having been able to fall asleep and deeming from the perfect silence of the dormitory that my companions were all wrapped in prof profound repose, rose softly, put on my frock over my nightdress, and without shoes, crept from the apartment and set off in quest of Miss Temple's room. It was quite at the other end of the house, but I knew my way, and the light of the unclouded summer moon entering here and there at passage windows enabled me to find it without difficulty. An odor of camphor and burnt vinegar warned me when I came near the fever room, and I passed its door quickly, fearful lest the nurse who sat up all night should hear me. I dreaded being discovered and sent back, for I must see Helen. I must embrace her before she died. I must give her one last kiss, exchange with her one last word. In this time period, they didn't have like space bubbles. Everyone was a lot closer, so kissing your friend or hugging them wasn't so taboo as it is today. Or maybe it's not taboo today, I don't know. Having descended a staircase, traversed a portion of the house below, and succeeded in opening and shutting, without noise, two doors, I reached another flight of stairs. These I mounted, and then just opposite to me was Miss Temple's room. A light shone through the keyhole, and from under the door, a profound stillness pervaded the vicinity. Coming near, I found the door slightly ajar, probably to admit some fresh air into the close abode of sickness. Indisposed to hesitate, and full of impatient impulses, soul and senses quivering with keen throes, I put it back and looked in. My eye sought Helen, and feared to find death. Close by Miss Temple's bed, and half covered with its white curtains, there stood a little crib. I saw the outline of a form under the clothes, but the face was hid by the hangings. The nurse I had spoken to in the garden sat in an easy chair asleep. An unsnuffed candle burnt dimly on the table. Miss Temple was not to be seen. I knew afterwards that she had been called to a delirious patient in the fever room. I advanced, then paused by the crib side. My hand was on the curtain, but I preferred speaking before I withdrew it. I still recoiled at the dread of seeing a corpse. Helen, I whispered softly, are you awake? She stirred herself, put back the curtain, and I saw her face, pale, wasted, but quite composed. She looked so little changed that my fear was instantly dissipated. Can it be you, Jane? she asked in her own gentle voice. Oh, I thought, she is not going to die. They are mistaken. She could not speak and look so calmly if she were. I got on to her crib and kissed her. Her forehead was cold and her cheek both cold and thin, and so were her hand and wrist, but she smiled as of old. Why are you come here, Jane? It is past 11 o'clock. I heard it strike some minutes since. I came to see you, Helen. I heard you were very ill and I could not sleep till I had spoken to you. You came to bid me goodbye then. You are just in time, probably. Are you going somewhere, Helen? Are you going home? Yes, to my long home, my last home. So home right here is, an ex is a metaphor for heaven, and so it's a play with words because Helen is a devout Christian, and Jane is too in her way. She grows in her faith throughout the book, um, but there's definitely a distinction that Helen is more uh, faithful than Jane is. No, no, Helen, I stopped distressed. While I tried to devour my tears, a fit of coughing seized Helen. It did not, however, wake the nurse. When it was over, she lay some minutes exhausted. Then she whispered, Jane, your little feet are bare. Lie down and cover yourself with my quilt. I did so. She put her arm over me and I nestled close to her. After a long silence, she resumed, still whispering, I am very happy, Jane. And when you hear that I am dead, you must be sure and not grieve. There is nothing to grieve about. We all must die one day, and the illness which is removing me is not painful. It is gentle and gradual. My mind is at rest. I leave no one to regret me much. I have only a father, and he is lately married, and will not miss me. By dying young, I shall escape great sufferings. I had not qualities or talents to make my way very well in the world. I should have continu been continually at fault. But where are you going to, Helen? Can you see? Do you know? I believe. I have faith. I'm going to God. Where is God? What is God? And so these are profound philosophical questions, right? Like Jane's asking desperate because she wants to know that she'll see Helen again. Um, but these are big philosophical questions that scholars study throughout the ages. My maker and yours, who will never destroy what he created. I rely implicitly on his power and confide wholly in his goodness. I count the hours till that eventful one arrives which shall restore me to him, reveal him to me. You are sure then, Helen, that there is such a place as heaven and that our souls can get to it when we die? 
I am sure there is a future state. I believe God is good. I can resign my immortal part to him without any misgiving. God is my father. God is my friend. I love him. I believe he loves me. And shall I see you again, Helen, when I die? You will come to the same region of happiness, be received by the same mighty universal parent, no doubt, dear Jane. Again, I question, but this time only in thought. Where is that region? Does it exist? And I clasped my arms closer around Helen. She seemed dearer to me than ever. I felt as if I could not let her go. I lay with my face hidden on her neck. Presently, she said in the sweetest tone, how comfortable I am. That last fit of coughing has tired me a little. I feel as if I could sleep, but don't leave me, Jane. I like to have you near me. I'll stay with you, dear Helen. No one shall take me away. Are you warm, darling? Yes. Good night, Jane. Good night, Helen. She kissed me and I her, and we both soon slumbered. When I awoke, it was day. An unusual movement roused me. I looked up. I was in somebody's arms. The nurse held me. She was carrying me through the passage back to the dormitory. I was not reprimanded for leaving my bed. People had something else to think about. No explanation was afforded then to my many questions, but a day or two afterwards, I learned that Miss Temple, on returning to her own room at dawn, had found me laid in the little crib, my face against Helen Byrne's shoulder, my arms around her neck. I was asleep, and Helen was dead. Her grave is in Brocklebridge Church. For 15 years after her death, it was only covered by a grassy mound. But now a gray marble tablet marks the spot, inscribed with her name and the words resurgam, which means in Latin, I shall rise again.